the stage is yours and we are very happy to have you. Thank you, Shai. So um, hi everyone, my name is Asher. I'm a, I work at NVIDIA and I'm part of a solution architect team in which we uh, interact with our end users, which can be data scientists, researchers um, and engineers and help them accelerate their workloads by learning about the different solutions that NVIDIA has to offer and when needed also get involved and really connect to their code in order to accelerate it utilizing NVIDIA's different capabilities. Today I want to talk about some of those capabilities and how you can um, accelerate different workloads, specifically uh, deep learning workloads. So let's get started. And the top overview, um, it's pretty dense. Okay, so uh, we're going to try to understand what NVIDIA is because there are some common misconceptions around this. We'll discuss GPUs, uh, CPUs, uh, heterogeneous um, uh, computing. We'll see how we can uh, program a GPU using utilizing CUDA. Um, we'll discuss different GPU architectures, families of GPUs, understand their strengths, and then understand how we can use those strengths, again, to um, perform some coding. And then we'll end with two examples uh, in the world of deep learning, which utilize uh, these capabilities. Now, as I said, this is pretty dense. I think we could theoretically also cover these topics in uh, an entire semester. So obviously I'm not gonna be able to go, there's a limit to how deep I'll be able to go. Um, and we'll try to uh, stay on track. Okay. And also I'll just mention that I, I, I know that there are also, uh, this is a pretty heterogeneous a group as well. There are people who don't come from a, a, a developer engineer background and that's fine. When needed, I'll explain uh, code snippets when we get to there. Okay, so uh, let's discuss where, where NVIDIA came from, where this whole began. So this began in 1999 when NVIDIA introduced the GPU, the graphical processing units. And these uh, enabled um, artists and engineers to create to perform image rendering in the world of computer graphics and computer gaming. And in order to perform image rendering on millions of pixels and images, we needed to perform uh, a way to perform parallel computing in, in a robust manner, in a way that scales well. And that's where uh, GPUs really came in and began. And it turned out that this capability of, of parallel computing can be uh, applied to many other domains as well. So for example, when we wanna create photorealistic images in the world of computer aided design, images that obey the laws of physics, the way light bounces off objects, the way a wind might behave, then there are things that you can create, again, with GPUs. In the world of HPC, high performance computing, so you can uh, sim perform different simulations such as molecular dynamic simulations using GPUs as well. And of course, machine learning and specifically deep learning as we'll go into uh, during this talk. Right, so um, I think we'll, we'll start by in, in the big bang, so to say, of, uh, of deep learning 2012, where Alex Grusevsky and a team of uh, Jeffrey Hinton um, competed in the ImageNet classification task. They won first place. They're passing second place by a very large margin. They did this by using ConvNets. And um, these convolutional neural networks and um, deep neural networks in general really started coming about already in the 50s, 1950s. And what allowed uh, this revolution was uh, two extra pillars, one being the uh, big data, the amount of information, good labeled information that a researcher can access, such as ImageNet with a million images. And the third pillar being the GPU. Okay, the graphical processing unit, which we'll discuss uh, throughout this talk. Now, um, in the world of deep learning specifically, and I assume this course is mainly focusing on, on computer vision, then tasks such as uh, image classification, object detection, localization, and so on. These are all tasks we can perform well enough as if the machine uh, can perform an, uh, an, an, a human uh, capability. And, and we can already perform these tasks in real time. So um, enabling self-driving vehicles to perform well without um, getting into accidents, they have to really um, make decisions based on computer vision in the split of a second. This is true not only in computer vision, it's true with other domains as well, speech, in which you might have applications such as a chatbot, where you would generally have many different models combining together in a pipeline, performing ASR, speech recognition, um, translation, NLP, and text-to-speech and so on, all this in under 
300 milliseconds in order to enable um, a natural conversation with the machine. Okay, so we really have both training in a way that uh, we can obtain amazing performing models and inferencing as well in real time on edge devices with low memory. So um, GPUs and CPU. I think this image can um, it really says it all, can capture in a way the essence of, of GPUs and CPUs, right? So really it depends on, on the tool. It depends on, on the problem that you're trying to face. As you're gonna see, I'm not gonna say GPUs are better than CPU. They're, they're supposed to replace CPUs. It really depends on the problem and the tool that we need. And you can look at this image and, and you can see, you know, a shark, an amazing, uh, so to say, uh, heavy weight lifter in the ocean, but it depends on the task. You might have millions of small tasks that can be performed in parallel, and then you could utilize uh, these small um, group of, of, of fish. So moving forward, let's discuss GPUs and, and CPUs. And specifically, we'll talk about what's called heterogeneous programming, OK? Um, so a CPU will generally run the different tasks on your machine in a serial manner. It will generally have up to a few cores that can perform in parallel, but generally will perform these tasks uh, serially. Again, these cores are extremely strong and CPUs really perform well. They, 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 this is what en enables the maintenance and uh, program execution on our machine. That being said, we can combine that capability with a GPU that has thousands of cores that can perform different tasks, different tasks such as uh, heavy parallel tasks. So for example, you might have a code performing a vector addition when the vector can be um, two to the power of 20 and much, much more than that. So you have millions of tasks, small tasks that can be performed in parallel. So in, in that case, we'll have such a program, the CPU can offload that part of work to the GPU to perform the work in parallel and really keep the, the, the CPU Busy at doing what it's good at, serial tasks. Okay. Now uh, I'll try to discuss what, what NVIDIA is. And I'll start by saying what it's not. Okay, so in, NVIDIA is, is not a hardware company. Or to put it differently, NVIDIA is not only a hardware company. Okay, NVIDIA is a full stack application optimization company that knows how to find applications that can be run in parallel and optimize them. Right? We don't own look at the hardware because the hardware itself is great, but if you don't accelerate applications, then we didn't do too much and we're here to accelerate applications. So for that, we have to look at the whole stack, right? And understand how, how different components interact with each other. We have to optimize them as well. Different interconnects between the GPUs, which can combine a server, which can interact with other servers in order to really perform parallel computing in the best possible way, All right? So um, even though hardware might reach some kind of limitation, GPUs are still able to accelerate because we focus on the applications. And if we look at this stack, then on the bottom we'll have our um, uh, unit of compute. That unit could be a GPU, it can be a server sitting in a rack, many servers, creating a supercomputer, many data centers. All of this we have to utilize and create in the best optimal way in order to uh, accelerate application. We do that using what's called CUDA. A computer unified device architecture. It's an architecture of ours that enables developers to interact with the hardware to accelerate code. On top of CUDA, we'll have different um, libraries such as um, QDNN, QBLAS for uh, linear algebra, QDNN for deep learning neural networks. On top of that, different frameworks, which you might know of like PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so on, will utilize these in different libraries. And then um, the engineers can then go and create their applications. We also create different applications in different domains as well. But during this talk, we'll try to focus on, on these few um, layers of the stack. Okay, now before I really dive deeper, I just wanna say that um, the best place to get started, I think this is important to note, is our NGC, NVIDIA GPU Cloud, which is our registry of containers. Our container is simply a way where we containerize different um, libraries, which we optimize in a monthly basis. So for example, if you're performing uh, speech recognition using one-on-one uh, -on -one convolutions or um, medical imaging with 3D convolutions. So we just, we just outputted um, QDNN 8.2, which gives an amazing, amazing um, 
outperformance to the CUDIN 8.0. Okay, yeah, talking about like you can have in some cases six times the throughput. So it's really amazing. And it's the best place to get started and know that you're getting the best software working on different hardware. And, and we show benchmarks for different GPUs, multi GPU training, what you can expect as well. Okay, now let's dive deeper into um, CUDA, GPUs, and how you can program GPUs. So what is CUDA? CUDA, as I noted, is a Compute Unified Device Architecture. It's a general purpose parallel computing platform, meaning it enables developers to write up code in a language which they know in a way which can interact with the GPU. So it's a, it's a programming model which abstracts away the different components of the execution model, how, how each thread might be executed on the machine itself, but you really come in and develop with uh, these high level uh, terms in a way that really enables you to interact with the GPU. Okay, and in, in addition, we have a runtime, a, um, a compiler, and which enables us to add minimal extensions to familiar environments, familiar software uh, languages, such as uh, C, C++, Fortran, and Python in a way that you can gain and um, leverage the different capabilities of the GPU. All right, so before I, again, dive deeper, I just want to mention that there are three ways to, to accelerate workloads. You can either do that with libraries such as CUDNN that I mentioned before, open ACC directives in which you would um, add a pragma to, to your code and telling the compiler this loop should be run in parallel. Right, these are pre-compiled, um, so to say, solutions. And the most robust and flexible solution would be coding in the programming languages themselves. And we'll try to dive a, a bit deeper into that direction. Okay, so in this section of CUDA, we'll um, start with a simple vector addition example. We'll see how we can write functions, which we call kernel to run on the GPUs, and how we would manage the memory of the GPU. All right, so um, terminology, we have some concepts that we have to um, go over first. So since we're talking about heterogeneous computing, again, GPUs and CPUs have to work together. The CPU must offload the um, parallel co uh, code to be executed on the GPU. So we really have to talk about different devices. Okay, we have the host, which is our CPU and its memory, the, the RAM. And we have the device, which is the GPU and its memory, the DRAM, okay? And any workflow working on GPUs will have three simple steps. The first being copy over data needed to be run on the GPU to the GPU memory from the CPU memory. After that, we'll move over the instructions needed to be run on the GPU, execute the part of the program that's being running on the GPU, and once we're finished with that, we can then return the memory back to the CPU. Okay, so three simple steps. Now let's look at, at again, a, a pretty simple example of vector addition. Specifically, it's um, SACSPY. Okay, so uh, it stands for a single precision x, a, a dot x plus y. All right. Um, so we have these two vectors, which can be extremely large, x and y. We'll take a um, uh, element wise multiplication of a scalar a times x. A can be one for, for this uh, scenario, it doesn't really make a difference. So it will be uh, essentially we're outputting x plus y equals z when a is equal to one. Okay, now um, this is a, a classic example to get started with. And that's because we can imagine how we would um, program this type of uh, a solution to this problem. Assuming we could have millions of workers or thousands of workers, say we're not um, limited by the amount of workers that we have, then what we could do is we could define each worker to look at a certain index in both vector x and y, multiply the, the location of that index in vector x by a, add to it the relevant place in vector y, and, out, and place that in the output vector z, right? assuming we have enough workers that can perform this in parallel. And this is a good example because this is what we would call uh, an embarrassingly parallel problem. Meaning there's no communication needed to be performed between the, the workers, right? They 
one each worker had its own index, looks at the relevant locations and x and y, places it in the vector z. No communication needed. That's why we're starting with this example. Now let's see how we can program this, both on the regular um, way we might program with a for loop, and how we can program this on a GPU. Okay, so um, assuming uh, they're really basic, uh, if people have run a basic uh, for loop in any language, then we should be fine here as well. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, C or C++. We have a, a function, sax by serial, which will take at input n, the amount of uh, elements in our vectors, the scalar a, and two vectors, x and y. And for each index, we'll perform um, an update to y in a serial uh, fashion. Well, we could call this z, and then it will be exactly the same image that we saw previously. OK, so that, that's our, our standard C code. And we would launch that code with a, with a simple um, so a simple uh, function execution, okay? So, and how, how would we now transfer over and perform that code on a GPU? So first of all, there's a few things to note. We have this global keyword, which is essential that we place it in front of the function that we wanna run on the GPU, okay? So this keyword will tell the compiler or NVCC compiler, which compiles code to run on the GPU, it will tell it this is code that has to be run on the GPU in parallel, okay? The, once we've created our function, and we'll see in a second what we do inside here, we, um, we launch the function with this triple angle bracket annotation, meaning over here inside this triple angle bracket, we'll define number of blocks and number of threads. Okay, so two things that we need, again, the global keyword, and this uh, triple angle bracket annotation. Now let's try to understand what threads are in blocks. I mentioned over here, number of blocks, number of threads. So the way this is constructed, and later on we'll try to understand more in depth why this is constructed this way and why we have this hierarchy. But essentially what we do, our function that runs on the GPU, we call it a kernel. This function is going to be run in parallel by our endless amount of workers that we have given to us on the GPU, okay? And this kernel, this function is going to, to be executed using a grid. A grid is going to have many blocks, okay? And each block will be having many threads or so to say workers. Okay, so this is the hierarchy. We have a kernel running on a grid. A grid is divided into blocks and blocks are divided into threads. Later, we'll try to understand why do we need this hierarchy, but Let's see how this um, relates to our problem. So say we have two, our vectors are of size 32, okay? And I'm going to be partitioning this into groups of workers, my threads. And I'm going, specifically the, the, the next level up is going to be groups of threads, the blocks of threads. I'm going to have four groups of threads, each, each with eight threads, okay? And the question is, now, how do I get an index? Remember I say we have to, each worker needs its own index to know how to perform the update of the function. How do I find a certain index in this um, annotation with this syntax? So what I would do is say, I wanna find the index of worker 21, the global index. So what I would do is I, I, I have in each of these kernels, we know a few things the second we get into, in, the second it's executed on a thread. Okay, a thread is part of a block, a, bar, a block is part of a grid, as we noted before. And we know the second we're in this kernel, we know which block the thread belongs to and which, what is the index of that thread inside the block. In addition, we also know how many threads we have in each block. That's all we need in order to find the index. So what we would do is, let's say M is the number of threads in each block, we'll multiply that by the index of the block, in this case two. And we'll add to that the thread index, which we'll call thread ID x dot x. Okay, these are the, way, the, the notation in which we gain the index of the current worker. Once we have that, we can just perform the update in a single line of code. So what we do over here is we get the index. And inside this function, the worker knows its index and can perform the update. As we did before, our output will be a dot x in that index plus y in that index. 
All right, great. And what we saw over here is we have this triple, triple angle bracket and this global keyword. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in the, in the world of CUDA is uh, memory management. As we noted, we have both a device, our GPU, it has its own memory. We have a host and it adds its own memory. And we have to, um, if we're say pro programming in C, we have to manage that memory. So you could do that in, in simple code say, as you would do say in, in a C programming language just as um, using CUDA malloc and CUDA free and CUDA memcopy to allocate memory on the device and transfer over memory information to that location in the memory. Okay, so we also have to be able to manage our, men our memory. So that's really, I'm not gonna go in deeper into that because again, the, the, the essence of this talk is not programming in C or, or even CUDA. So the question is I wanna, I wanna understand first, why do we need threads? Why do we need this hierarchy? Why many threads in each block? Okay, so to understand this, we, I, I wanna go back to the problem that we started with, the Sachs by problem or a summation of two vectors. And we, we noted that yeah, yeah. that problem, if people could just put on mute, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks. So we noted that um, that problem is um, embarrassingly parallel, so to say. It's um, completely independent threads, but that's not always the case. We might have a algorithm such as, uh, say, a stencil algorithm, which you can view simply as a 1D convolution in which you have this sliding window, okay, these blue blocks, which you convolve, which you convolve with an input vector and a certain window size, okay. So say I have this input vector, I have output vector on each element, and the output vector is going to be some kind of a summation or a dot product between this kernel and the uh, relevant locations in the input vector. And they will produce this red output over here. And let's say each thread will be performing this, um, this activity, right? Now note that the, the neighboring thread is going to be reusing a lot of the input values, right? Six elements over here were previously used by the neighboring, uh, by the neighboring thread. So we wanna reuse data. And it turns out that as we'll see later, you pay a lot on GPU land for um, memory uh, requests. And right? once you request data, you're gonna be waiting a lot. So we want to minimize the amount of data we're requesting. We want to share as much information as we can. So for that, each block of threads has shared memory, it's called, where all the threads can communicate and use memory that other threads have used as well. So this will save us a lot of time on um, memory fetches from the, from, the, from the RAM, from the DRAM. OK? So that's the reason why we would like a lot of threads, so to say, inside each block. And later on, we'll try to understand further what the hierarchy implies. Okay, so just a, a quick review of what we've seen so far. We've seen that we have a host, the CPU, the device, the GPU. We can launch parallel kernels on the, on the device using the global keyword. And we have this annotation of the triple angle brackets which tell us the number of blocks and how many threads do I have in each block, All right? So that's, with that, we've finished CUDA. Now let's talk about different architectures, GPUs, how they're constructed, their components, and how the knowledge of uh, this construction can help us also optimize or better understand how we should write better CUDA-based code. So what we'll see in this uh, section, we'll talk about two architectures. Architecture is a family of GPUs, so Fermi and Volta. Every few years we come out with a, a new family of GPUs, a current family is called uh, Ampere. We'll talk about memory hierarchy in the device. And we'll talk about kernel optimizations using the launch configuration, which launch, launch configurations are those parameters that we saw in the, curve, in the um, um, triple angle brackets. We'll start by discussing a compute capability. Compute capability is simply uh, a definition of the capabilities of a family of GPUs, of an architecture, so um, there are different things can, that can um, put apart different architectures from one another. One of them being the number of registers. A register is simply the information 
right? The memory needed for each thread to execute itself and uh, have information about the program that it's running, right? So these are the information that the thread needs in order to execute. We have different sizes of memories. So as we'll see, we'll have hierarchies of memories. Each memory might be a bit slower, a bit faster than one another, so this can affect the performance. And we have different features and capabilities, such as tensor cores, which is a feature that came out of Vault, and we'll discuss that later. Okay, so let's start with the Fermi architecture. This came out in 2010, quite a while ago. I'm starting over here because it's relatively straightforward. Okay, now let's see what we have over here. I assume you have to see my pointer. This is the GPU. And we see these rectangles over here that we want to zoom into. So let's zoom into that rectangle. And we each of these rectangles is what's called an SM, streaming multiprocessor. And this is what executes commands in parallel. Okay, it will can perform quite a lot of commands in parallel. We see over here it has these 32 cores that we can call scalar processors. Okay, this specific SM can perform 32 single precision, i.e., FP32 operations per clock cycle, or 32 N32 operations per clock cycle, or 16, being half of the amount of cores, double precision operations per second. Okay, so 64 operate, uh, floating point 64 operations per, per cycle. Um, a few more things to note over here that are important. First of all, we have a shared memory. We noted before that a shared memory is what allowed different threads to uh, communicate and share information. And we have this register file. And this register file in this pretty old architecture is 128,000 bytes. Now this is a, uh, a whopping number, okay? It's extremely large. If you compare it to a CPU, they'll only have a few bytes of a register. And we'll have to try to understand why do we need such large register files in our GPUs, okay? This is important. Okay, um, let's move on to the next compute capability. Specifically, we'll look at Volta, came out in 2000. In 17, compute capability 7.0. And there are a few things to note over here. First of all, we'll start by the DRAM. So over here, we can have already 32 gigabyte, gigabyte and in uh, Fermi, we only had six gigabyte of DRAM. Um, we have what we see that the SM itself, okay, this is the zoomed in SM, we see it has four parts. Each part has different work schedulers, which schedules different uh, tasks simultaneously. And in addition, an important addition that came into Volta is called tensor cores. Okay, so tensor cores are specialized hardware that can perform matrix multiplications and um, additions in an extremely less, fast, fast way. We'll see uh, soon a table of how fast compared to regular cores. And what the, what the GPU can do is once it sees these multiplications, it can offload the work to the tensor cores and perform it much faster. Okay, and matrix multiplications are ubiquitous in deep learning, so it really could give a substantial gain when using tensor cores. And later we'll also discuss tensor cores and how we use them, utilize them, and how we can uh, visualize and uh, profile the usage of these tensor cores. Now I want to. Now we talked about a few architectures. Let's talk about thread hierarchy and execution model. So we kn we noted before in, in the programming model we have we have threads come together to create blocks, come to together to create uh, grids. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear. You. Okay, just everything froze for me. Second. Okay, I'm back. I don't know what happened. Um, okay, I see. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit slow over here. So if this continues, I'll just turn off my video. But uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so we know that again, we had thread come together to create a thread of blocks, uh, um, a block of threads, which come together to create a grid, which executes my kernel, the function that runs in parallel on the GPU. Um, we can do a one to one mapping and what happens in the hardware where a thread will live and reside on a scalar processor on a core. That will enable the execution of the thread. Many threads come together to create a block, which will reside on an SM, okay? Currently, um, a, uh, a block has to live on a single SM throughout its whole entire lifespan. 
And that's where it lived, that's where it resides till it finishes its execution. The SM will execute the thread in the block. And together, we can combine many of these SM to create our device, our GPU. Um, and so we create many blocks of threads to run on many SMs in order to fully utilize our GPU. Okay, so you would theoretically want to have at least as many blocks as you have SMs so that the blocks will be divided between the, um, the SMs and you'll fully utilize your hardware. Okay, the last concept I want to refer to is called a warp. We have not mentioned this in the programming model, but this is important in the hardware world. Okay, and what it is, a warp, is basically taking a, a block of threads and dividing them into groups of 32 threads. Okay, so first of all, this means that we want our, our block to be a multiply of 32. And these warps is our basic unit of execution. We don't work with a single thread in GPU land. We work with these warps. And, and uh, a warp is going to be running on an SM, which is going to be running uh, this warp in what's called SIMD, single instruction multiple data. So every uh, worker, every thread is going to be using maybe different data, but running the same, the same instruction simultaneously. All right, so just to sum this up, since I see we're starting to run out of time over here, the way this looks is uh, the following. We have our GPU, there's an Ampere GPU. It has 108 SMs. We'll take our CUDA program, our kernel, divide it into blocks. Each block will reside on a different SM. Let's zoom into this uh, SM and this block. Each block will be divided into warps. Each warp will be scheduled to run concurrently on the given hardware with the scheduler of the SM, All right? And we have four of those schedulers. Right, so that's, that's, our, um, that's our GPU. Now let's talk about memory hierarchy, also very important. So the memory model, again, referring to thread, thread block and grid, let's talk about the me different memory types that each one of these um, uh, units can interact with. The thread has what's called uh, local memory, mainly um, it's going to be ma mainly registers, which it needs in order to execute extremely fast. A thread block is going to have shared memory, as we noted before, so that different threads can interact. And a grid, okay, our whole entire kernel, which has to run the GPU, is going to be using global memory, which is our DRAM. Okay, so another way to look at this is um, we have our global memory. Again, the CPU will be sending uh, data, so that it will reside in the global memory. From the global memory has to go to the uh, registers so that the threads can work on them. And this goes through different caching mechanisms. Then it will find and end up at the SM level. Each SM has shared memory for different threads and registers for each thread. In the A100 GPU, which you can have 40 gigabyte or even 80 gigabyte today of um, DRAM. So it will look something like this. And note that over here we have, um, we have registered 256,000 bytes. Okay, so again, a very large uh, size register file. We have to understand why. Okay, so regarding the different uh, the pieces of the memory hierarchy, so as we said, local storage very fast. It works in the thread level. Shared memory is also very fast. Different threads can communicate via the shared memory. We have different caches. We're not going to go too much into caches uh, during this talk. And we have the global memory. Global memory is fast, but it's relatively very slow compared to the shared memory or the register. What do I mean by slow? I mean, it could take something like 400 cycles for a uh, byte of memory that's needed by a thread to show up at the register of that thread. Okay, so 400 cycles, we can perform quite a lot of computation in 400 cycles. So, ha so if we have to wait 400 cycles each time for, uh, um, for memory to show up, then we'll be really underutilizing our GPU. And we have to understand how we can tackle this problem, okay? So let's see how we tackle that problem and then we'll really discuss the launch configuration. So I'll show in many cases, I, I rather recompute values rather than caching them. So if in CPU, I would 
do serial computation. I would store previous results and use them. And in GPU, I'd rather just- no, you, you also perform caching, we also have caching, not add advanced at the CPU caching, but you do not wanna um, request data over and over again. I just have different implementations, have uh, different math libraries, how you perform matrix multiplication, you could do it different ways. How do we utilize our GPU in the best possible way so that we're, first of all, extracting as data as a uh, few times as we need, right? You can perform matrix um, row dot, uh, vec dot uh, column, you can call those columns many, many times, right? So you have to see how you can perform that in, in, a, in, a, in a way which makes sense knowing the different um, capabilities and uh, downsides of the GPU, right? So these are things you have to take into, into play. People who write CUDA program really have to have to understand GPUs and, um, and, and, and that's what they do all day, basically. Okay, we have hundreds of developers, that's what they're doing, creating these libraries. And that's why applications later on can really utilize them and leverage their capabilities. Okay. Um, Cool. So again, 400 cycles is a latency. Okay, latency is going to be, we'll define it as the, the time from request, a thread request a byte. How long do they have to wait to that uh, byte to uh, come and uh, um, reside in the register? That will take, can take 400 cycles. And we have to overcome this problem. And as we'll see, the way GPUs overcome this problem, and they do, is by hiding the latency. Okay. A GPU essentially is a latency hiding machine. Now let's see an example for this. Okay, and I see that I have to start um, picking up the pace, but let's see uh, uh, a simple example. Okay, let's say I have two vectors and I wanna multiply them element wise. Again, two very large vectors. I wanna use threads to perform this in, in, um, in parallel. Okay, so as we noted before, we're gonna be having this line over here, the output, Vector C is going to be in a certain index. It's going to be the input A in that index times the vector input B in that index. And we get the index the way we saw previously, okay? Using the block idx.x and, and so on. In machine code and executable code, it's going to be looking something like it. We'll have different instructions that each instruction is what a, a thread or a warp or thread is going to be executing. Well, have three instructions. The first instruction is going to perform a load instruction, taking the uh, element in A in a certain index and placing it in register zero. Instruction one, which will follow, will do the same thing for vector B and place that in re re register one. And instruction two is going to perform multiplication. I see that you don't see my um, my pointer anymore. Do you see my pointer? Never mind. One second. Okay. Um, and now it froze again. One second, it froze again. All right, so I'm gonna act as if you hear me. Why did this freeze? I can't, okay. Okay, it's kind of messed up. So one second, I'm just gonna go back. So what you see over here in the bottom, instruction two, it's going to perform multiplication of those values in the register one and zero and place that in register two. Okay, this is the, the plan for each one of our threads. Now, as we said, our basic unit of execution is not a thread, it's a warp. Okay, so what you see over here on the left, you see warps, warp zero till warp n. And in each, in each cycle, we wanna perform a different instruction. Okay, so say that our scheduler and the SM chose warp zero in cycle zero and performs instruction one. Instruction one, as we know, you see it in the top on the right, Instruction, instruction zero, sorry, is a load instruction, okay? And load instructions are not what we call stalling, okay? They're, um, they're not blocking. I can perform a load, I request data. Until the data uh, shows up, I can continue on working, okay? So I continue working. And the next instruction, which gets scheduled is instruction one, again, on warp zero, which also asks for data, okay? Um, that data is going to be Again, a non-blocking uh, instruction. Once we once we finish with instruction one, we want to move on to instruction two, which uses the data that we try to, to access. That, that data is not located yet in the register, and so we stall. The scheduler 
free this disk warp and moves on to the, a different warp. So we move on to warp one in cycle two, perform again the same two instructions, load to uh, register zero, load to register one, and then it will freeze, it will stall since it doesn't have the information needed. And all these warps, since again, there are very high latency when requesting data, data fetches, they will all stall. And we'll move on to different warps. At some time in our timeline, the data needed will show up in the registers. And so warp zero can go back and be executed. Okay. Um, and then it performs the work. We move on. It gets an output in uh, instruction two, and we move on to warp one, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, a few things I want to take from this from this slide is the fact again we have a latency which is very high, and a lot of warps are going to be waiting. So what we want to do is we want to schedule as many warps as we can, so that we won't be waiting. Imagine we would have a very long line of of of. Um, of, of many warps working together, executing that. So they'll all, they'll all be waiting together. We want to split that up into, into small, so to say, workers that can be run in parallel without performing this blocking on the whole system. Okay, so if we have many, many SMs, so even uh, many, many uh, warps and many, many threads, so each thread will be performing some kind of work at a given cycle. And if the, the data they need is not located, then it will just stall and we'll move on to a different warp. And notice also over here, we move between the warps in zero time, okay? The zero context switching, meaning we're moving between these 32 threads to these 32 threads in zero time. The way this is possible is due to the fact that we have extremely large register files as noted before. Register files enable the uh, threads to access the data that you need in order to, to execute in it basically zero time. That's why we have these extremely large register files, okay? So the basic idea over here is that a GPU is a latency hiding machine. We want to have many, many um, small pieces of work, small warps being performed simultaneously so that at any given time, some instruction is going to be performed. And if that data is not located, we're not going to be waiting. We'll be moving on to something else to be performed. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too much into detail, but uh, regarding thread number of uh, thread blocks. So we want to have at least as many thread blocks as we have um, SMs, since a, a thread block lives on SM, and we want to really uh, split the, the workload be between all the SMs so our GPU will be working. Basically, we also want to have a few more blocks than that, since uh, it's, it's called a, a tail effect, where um, certain regions in our, in our inputs might behave a bit differently in a kernel. So some kernels might be uh, uh, longer and we don't have a, a, this effect where in the end we'll only have a small regions of our GPU working. So we wanna split the information as much as we can by creating more blocks. Um, so going back and finishing this section of the talk, summary this up really, really fast. So we basically wanna have a lot of threads in our, um, to be executed. Why do we want a lot of threads? Because we want to have we want to have a lot of warps. We want to have a lot of warps so that every given cycle something can be happening on my GPU. Right? If I only had a few warps, then I'd be running out of time waiting for information to show up. While other warps could have been performing work. So I want to have a lot of warps, a lot of threads. And I basically also want to have a lot of thread blocks as many, at least as many SMs as, as I have on my device. Okay, um, one more comment before we move on to applications. And that is that when we access memory from let's say the DRAM, we can access, we have to access blocks of memory, okay? A thread, even if it wants, even if a warp, entire warp only wants one um, byte, we have to access at least 32 bytes of, of, um, of memory. So we want to try to utilize as much information as we can in those 32 bytes. Okay, we have to access the entire block, what's called of memory. So each time, so we want this to really overlap well with the groups of threads that we have. Okay, I'm not going to go too much into that, but it might help us later in, in one of the applications. Summing up this part of the of the talk, this lecture. 
we'll end with uh, this nice image of the A100 GPU, the newest GPU of NVIDIA. We have over here 108 SMs. Again, these are the SMs for uh, warp schedulers in each one of these SMs. We have caching and um, different uh, components which are important, but I'm not gonna go into in this talk. All right. Now I wanna talk about some applications. Um, start with this image over here, stating that we have two, two, two phases in um, a workload of an AI application, right? We have to train the, so to say, the, the model, the deep learning model, uh, and so that it will get as good at the evaluation score as, as it can. And once we were uh, happy with the scores that we have, we then take that model and run it in inferencing, an inferencing phase that can be an edge device with a, a low memory constraints. And we want that, theoretically want that model to run in real time in many, in many scenarios as well. So we want to see, first of all, how we can optimize our training phase so they will run faster. And then we want to see how we can um, compress, so to say, our, our neural network so it can run faster in inferencing time. Cool. So let's talk about training. Again, I'm, I'm really touching the, the uh, tip of the iceberg over here in NVIDIA different solutions. But I think these are things that can, can get people started with really few uh, lines of code. Yeah. Asha, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are a bit short on time. Um, I think. Till 11.15? It's 12.15-ish. Uh, 12 12 uh, but uh, I think uh, if we can. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, overview uh, talking about different uh, cores, the tensor cores, and uh... that, that, that's this part right, right now. Oh, okay, that's sorry, right sorry to. No problem. All right, so these are two applications. If we'll get to the, the second application, it's called sparsity, and that's great. If not, we'll end over here. This is called um, AMP, automatic mixed precision. Now let's discuss precision. So in this section, I'll talk about FP32, which is a, simply an IEEE format representation of, of numbers. Okay, we present each, all our numbers in 32 bits. We have millions of weights, millions of numbers, possibly even billions in our neural network. And we would normally represent them in FP32 format, okay, 32 bits. The reason is the following. So um, in a classical deep learning uh, pipeline you and during training, we start out, let's say, with a randomly initialized model with weights. Okay, this is a toy example, a 2D2 example. Um, and we try to tweak the values of those weights by computing the gradients in the back propagation so that we will advance to a good local minima um, during our optimization landscape. Okay. Now, FP32 has a few advances, advances over FP16, which is half the bits in which first of all, have a, a huge dynamic range, can uh, represent a very large range, but also can represent much, much smaller values, uh, much uh, smaller decimals than uh, FP16 can, okay? Um, so what's the danger in using FP16? The danger is that our gradients, which we're calculating are essential for uh, updating our model might zero out. They might be too small, it might zero out. And while we're tweaking the values, we might end too early and we won't converge to our required local minima of the loss, okay? That's the danger of using FP16, whereas FP32 can represent many more um, uh, decimals. Now, why would we want to use FP16? Well, first of all, it's half the bits, right? So at half the bits, we're using uh, half the information. But in addition, in Volta, the architecture we talked about last, uh, NVIDIA introduced what's called the Tensor Core. And tensor Core is, again, specialized hardware that can perform matrix multiplication in addition extremely fast. Now let's look at this table for, for just a moment. In Volta, we introduced Tensor Cores for FP16 operations, meaning you'd have to perform FP16 operations in order to, to utilize Tensor Cores. But if we compare FP16 uh, uh, multiply add operations per cycle, per SM, we see that on a regular core, we have 128 on regular CUDA cores. And on these tensor cores, we can perform 512 of these operations per second. If we move over to Ampere, our latest architecture, we see that also in FP32, 
NVIDIA, we created this, uh, this format called TF32, in which also in FP32, we can get this substantial boost, okay? Eight times the amount of, uh, of throughput of, um, of these operations per clock cycle per SM. Okay, so we can perform now in uh, TF32 500 cells operations and in FP16, 1,024 operations per clock cycle per SM. So we want to utilize this capability. And in Volta, at least, we have to move to FP16 in order to utilize this. But as we noted, FP16 is dangerous, right? Well, zero error gradients. So what can we do? So NVIDIA created what's called AMP, Automatic Mixed Precision. And the idea is, is really simple, OK? What we do over here is we use FP32 where we need, where it's essential. And otherwise, we might zero out, uh, getting NAMs all over the place. And everywhere else, generally performing major multiplication and additions, we'll be offloading the workload to the tensor force. That's the idea. Okay, that's the basic idea. It's pretty simple and it works well. So um, to really use it, I'll, I'll explain in a bit more depth what really happens behind the scenes. But let's look at a coding example in PyTorch. Okay, PyTorch, you can perform this in three lines of code. Of code. So first thing you would do is you import the, the library, you would uh, wrap the model in your optimizer, and then you'd be performing what's called a scale loss. What is scale loss? Well, scale loss takes our loss value that we calculated during the forward pass, multiply that by a very large uh, scalar, okay? And then performs back propagation in FP16. Why do we do that? Well, we said that the danger in FP16 is that our gradients might zero out. Zero out, won't update, we'll stop early our training. Well, if I multiply our uh, loss by a very large value, and since back propagation is essentially a high dimensional uh, chain rule, then once I multiply the loss, that law that by by a scalar, that scalar is going to be multiplied also by all the gradients. The gradients are going to be enlarged by a large scalar, and then I'd be able to represent the gradients in FP sixteen, right? Because I'm not looking at the small number; I'm looking at the small number times a very large number. Once I perform back propagation, I, I, I um, calculated the gradients. I want to perform weight update. Then what I would do is I would move the gradient that I have in FP16 to FP32, divide that number by the scalar, by the large scalar, return to the original gradient when it's represented in FP32, and then perform the weight update in FP32. OK? That's, that's the, the, the flow. Um, there are a few other things that happen in, in, in addition. There are a few different uh, regions in which we might have to use FP32, such as uh, calculating the loss, softmax, exponents, things like that. We don't want to get uh, NANDs. But NVIDIA really found those different places. And where needed, we perform FP32. Everywhere else, FP16. And this is a, um, a summary of that. OK. Now. How do I profile? How do I know that I'm actually using this TensorCore? I, 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 want, to, I want my training to go three times faster. I want to be using TensorCore. Am I using my TensorCore? It's, it's like a black box in, in the end of the day. So NVIDIA created this tool called DealProf. Okay, it's an extension to TensorBoard. You can use it also with your coding in PyTorch. It comes in all our containers that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And what you see over here in this uh, UI, you see the top 10 operations being run currently on the GPU. With regarding the um, the time of the operation, we see over here whether or not these operations are eligible for TensorCore and whether or not they're using TensorCore. And most of these operations over here, we see we're not using uh, we're not using TensorCore. So in addition, you'd have um, and a device part of this UI which will tell you what you should do to utilize your TensorCore. Okay, so it's it's a really cool tool, and again, it's uh, part of our containers as well that we. Um, we, we output every one, once a month in our NGC. Okay, so moving forward, um, in Ampere, as I noted, we have something that's called TF32 representation. And in this representation, which is the default and what you'll have in the newer GPUs, okay, in the newer GPUs, you're not really running FP32, you're running TF32. Um, and you can, you can uh, decide not to use this representation, but we've checked on every single uh, deep learning model that we had got our hands on in the universe and and it really got same performance. Okay, so what this does is we're taking 
the exponent. Every um, floating point is represented is constructed of, uh, of a sine bit, an exponent, and a mantissa. Okay, not going too much into that, but what we're doing is we're taking the exponent of the uh, FP32, placing that in the TF32 representation, and taking the 10 bits of the mantissa and placing that in the TF32, 10 bits of the FP16, which gives us 19 bits. These 19 bits can then go and run on the tensor cores, which are special that were created in the Ampere um, GPUs. Okay. And what we see over here is a um, comparison of results that you might achieve on different domains, different tasks, and deep learning. Um, so if you're only looking at TF32 compared to uh, FP32 and Volta, then you could have from two to, I think, 8x. And if you're willing to move to FP16, with again, those three lines of code, then you can already get a 15x performance boost in, in different uh, different use cases. All right, and we're all the time optimizing this, all the time performing optimizations for the QDNN level as well in order to get these best performances. Now, I have four minutes. Should I talk about sparsity? I think we should uh, stop here. We have an uh, adjacent seminar starting oh, okay. in four minutes. Oh, OK. Uh, but uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, that would be lovely. But uh, basically, all these decisions about floating point and uh, tensor floating point, it's uh, transparent to ours, to our as users. So right. We can. Right. And yeah, in, in this talk, I really wanted to, um, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward to, to give a talk, which is very, very high level. I wanted to dive a, deep, a bit deeper so the audience could have a better understanding of what's going on GPUs, what, what, what's its capabilities. Again, a latency hiding machine at the end of the day, how it does what it does, how we can tweak if we need. And, and if a user wants to go and, and then learn CUDA by itself or use a different libraries or open ACC, then they could go and do that while understanding the benefits and uh, uh, leveraging the capabilities of the GPUs. Okay, if, uh, do we have any questions about uh, for Asher? If we want to, I have a question, sorry. If, if we want to, uh, let's say, program something that is uh, autonomous, let's say on a, a autonomous chip, like I think you have Jetson or something like this, do, do I need to do it in CUDA or do I have an API that can translate it to? Right. Yeah, so um, as noted before, we have three different um, things you could try out, right? Uh, programming in CUDA is, is, might be the, the third uh, re, um, resource I think you would, you would uh, go to. So first you can use libraries, okay? And, and, all, and a lot of the uh, frameworks that we use in deep learning are using these libraries and these libraries are optimized, right? So if you can use a library, you should because they're optimized by thousands of, of developers in NVIDIA that know exactly how to tweak everything so they will perform in the best possible way, okay? Um, the second is OpenACC, which again, directives you could just add to your code telling the compiler they needs to be running this in parallel, also gives amazing results. And the third is uh, going to CUDA, which uh, will give you the highest flexibility and creating exactly precisely the, the latency budget, the throughput that you want. Okay, thanks. Okay, if there are no other questions, then uh, Ashel, thank you very much for coming and teaching us about uh, GPUs and their hardware and all these uh, fantastic capabilities they have for deep learning. Uh, I think it will help us uh, better understand why our code runs faster or slower uh, if we are not kind to it. Yeah. in the future and i think it's also give us pointers to what tools we could use like this uh, dl profiler you showed Definitely. that if we indeed if we want to explore and uh, better our code these are tools that we should uh, be using so i think this is not uh, the end of the story but just the beginning of a journey so these are pointers uh, for us uh, where to look and where to learn and uh, the center of AI uh, has relations with uh, NVIDIA. So if we want, if you want to explore uh, 
more in depth for some of these topics, we can arrange for uh, some meeting or some specialized uh, uh, inf instructors uh, to give you more knowledge on these uh, specific topics. But yeah. uh, Asha, thank you for giving us this uh, overview. Happily, we, we, we'd be happy to, to interact. Uh, as you noted, we work with White Weissman uh, pretty closely. And um, yeah, I'll also send out a great blog that we have about profiling and specifically using GILPROF. It's a really great read and explains how to use it. Um, and I'll also send you how, how users um, in this talk can, can interact with me uh, later on.